Uh, good morning and welcome to the fourth meeting of the Education and Skills Committee in 2019. I remind everyone to turn their mobile phones to silent um, so they don't disrupt the meeting. Um, we have received apologies today from Tavish Scott and from Ross Greer. Our first agenda item is our inquiry into Scottish National Standardised Assessment and we have two panels of witnesses today. But firstly, can I welcome Professor Andy Hargreaves, Research Professor, Boston College and Visiting Professor of the University of Ottawa. And can I open, uh, Professor Hargreaves, with just asking you to briefly outline your international experience as it relates to the inquiry. Uh, thank you. Is it Madam Convener? Is that how I address you? Yeah. <laughs> However you like. Convener is okay. fine. <laughs> um, uh, well, well, first of all, thank you for inviting me to uh, present evidence to this uh, uh, very important committee at this uh, crucial time in uh, Scottish education in thinking about how best to forge a way forward on an assessment strategy uh, that will benefit all students, actually, in Scottish education. Um, I, uh, began, uh, I began adult life as, um, as a teacher, then a researcher. Uh, I worked in universities in, um, in England and then in 1987 moved to uh, Canada where I set up a thing called the International Centre for Educational Change in Toronto. In the last 15 years I've worked at uh, Boston College, which is not in Boston and not a college. Uh, it's 100 metres outside Boston and is, a, and is a university, famous actually for uh, the International Mass and Science Studies, which are uh, administered from there, though that's not something I'm directly connected with. Uh, I've just moved back to Canada, uh, where I'm also a citizen, as well as a UK citizen with my family, and uh, connected with the University of Ottawa. Uh, my international experience is um, I've done research in a, in a number of countries around educational reform, change, uh, systemically and in terms of its impact on uh, teachers and the teaching profession. Uh, this is across a range of countries, but not too many, including Singapore, the United States, the UK, um, Canada, and um, that's probably about it. Um, they, uh, I've also do advisory work uh, with uh, with governments, sometimes on an occasional basis and sometimes on a more sustained basis. So for several years, I've been one of six advisors for Premier uh, Kathleen Wynne, who was Premier of Ontario, a province of 13 million people, until uh, May. Uh, when she was deposed by uh, an election and uh, have been one of uh, 10 international uh, advisors for a Scottish government, proud to be over the last uh, few years. I've also been engaged with OECD reviews of uh, different countries, the one in Scotland you probably know well, there were a team of four of us. Uh, just prior to that, one of uh, Wales, which is on dealing with similar kinds of issues to to Scotland, and sometime before that, one of uh, Finland and its uh, and its leadership strategies. Uh, I'm not really known as a measurement specialist, so if you ask me any technical items, anything about technical items or uh, design or validity and reliability tests, uh, my answers will be extremely disappointing. But. But, but, we, but what I do see is, as I deal with work on, on, on change in uh, schools, school systems and societies, assessment comes across the radar a lot in terms of its connection to everything else. So I'm really very concerned, and I think what, what I can best help you with is how assessment is in, in uh, benign and less benign ways uh, interconnected with other parts of the improvement agenda. Thank you very much, Professor Hargreaves. I'm going to ask um, Liz Smith to... Uh, good morning, uh, Professor Hargreaves, and thank you very much for providing us with uh, all that international experience in which we are actually extremely interested. Um, you've obviously outlined your experience in the different countries uh, and uh, mentioned the OECD where we were given a, a sort of set of six uh, criteria which we need to adhere to if we're going to make attainment effective. Um, just in light of your final comment there, would, would you be able to um, start this morning's evidence session in providing us with uh, some examples from your international experience where you feel that uh, schools have managed to improve their um, outcomes for young people 
And if you can relate that to the uh, standardised assessments that they've used, I know you can't go into the technical details, uh, as you said, but just, just where you feel Scotland could learn some lessons from that international experience would be very helpful to the committee. Yeah, so uh, first is the important thing is to learn and not to copy. Um, and uh, with a teacher or a country, I always advise uh, never look at one model and copy it, but always look at a no, uh, no model will have everything uh, that you want. Uh, but if you have a number of models that you look at, then really you are empowered to, to learn what it is from these that are most relevant to you and to your uh, country. Um, one that many people go to is Finland. Uh, I'm a great fan of Finland. If I had to live anywhere else, it's one of the happiest countries on, on earth. Uh, it's a nation that values learning immensely. It has very, um, very low achievement gaps. Uh, there is almost an accidental relationship uh, between family background and achievement in uh, Finland, statistically. Uh, so it's of very high interest, I think, uh, for everybody internationally, um, because it performs well on overall performance and also, and also on equity. Uh, the, the assessment system in, in Finland is uh, one that is based on, uh, until secondary school leaving, is one that is based in any uh, system-wide sense is based on samples rather than a census. And so many people, including from time to time myself, are uh, extremely interested in the idea of a sample as a way of preventing people from teaching to the test uh, or from gaming the system. Uh, the, difficulty with uh, Finland, uh, so I think the benefit of Finland that we can learn from is, is that most assessment is directed to improving uh, learning and is uh, done and chosen and developed uh, within schools with some collaboration uh, within and across uh, municipalities, the equivalent of our local authorities. Uh, the, the difficulty with transposing the Finnish model to other places, which we considered uh, in the last few months in Ontario when the six advisors conducted an assessment review uh, for, for the province of Ontario. Um, we seriously considered the arguments of a sample versus a census. Is uh, Finland is not very diverse as a country at this moment, although it may become so increasingly over time. And uh, if you are diverse as a country and you have wider inequities, uh, which we do in Scotland, and in fact, Scotland's not unusual in, in that sense, uh, then you, you do need to be able to identify um, which populations are in greatest need. Um, so, for instance, in Ontario and Canada, the most persuasive argument I heard as a fellow advisor uh, about the need for a census rather than a sample uh, was from one of my uh, Caribbean Canadian colleagues who felt that there was a neglect, and there is, uh, in Ontario of his historically black Canadians. So these are not recent immigrants and refugees who get a lot of attention, but these are black Canadians who go back sometimes to slavery and the Underground Railroad. Uh, and are one of the made most vulnerable groups in terms of disadvantage. And, and he felt that having data which would enable you to identify exactly when and where those groups were being overlooked was, was essential to equity. So um, I, I'm, I'm beginning with an example of something that looks really promising and offers uh, a, a sample, but it's persuaded me in some cases that where there is great inequity and increasing diversity, some kind of census can be, can be more uh, beneficial. If you look at other countries that use large-scale standardized assessments, uh, which Finland doesn't, uh, first of all, you have to disconnect the words large-scale from standardized. So something I've seen in your previous documents that I've been looking through is, uh, of course, many teachers everywhere use standardised assessments. They're just not large scale. So they may use a different one in this school 
uh, than they do in that school than they do in another school. There are very good standardised assessments, reliability and validity tested in literacy, in mathematics and so on. Uh, the issue is, is large-scale standardised assessments. Uh, can they bring about improvement that is authentic? I can give you many examples where they bring about improvement that is not authentic. Uh, so the improvements that have been documented numerically in the United States and in, uh, and in England have been soundly denounced by the statistical societies of uh, both countries as being statistically impossible uh, without actually in some ways uh, faking or fabricating uh, the results or the, or the practices that, that lead to the results. Um, even in Ontario, which is mid-stakes rather than high stakes, uh, and so perhaps one of the best examples that, that, that we might consider. Um, so when I say it's not high, so high stakes, is um, the assessments give you the power to intervene, to punish, uh, to remove uh, to remove head teachers from the school, to close the school and open it as a open it as another kind of school. Uh, Ontario doesn't use those uh, sanctions and provides a lot of support, but but there are mid stakes in that um, those are the ones we probably have to pay attention to here, where knowledge of the results and the patterns uh, can uh, lead some. Uh, school district directors with sometimes pressure from the central government to exert undue pressure on their schools to raise their results over relatively short periods of time. And this creates all the negative impacts we know of, uh, of large-scale assessments. So even in Ontario, uh, mid-stakes rather than high-stakes produces some negative consequences. Um, influenced by Scotland, actually, we uh, spent some time on the review trying to figure out ways to maintain a large-scale assessment without those negative impacts. OK, uh, that's extremely uh, helpful. Um, it, one of the um, dilemmas, I think, is fair to say, that has been flagged up to us in the previous two committee sessions that we've had on this um, issue of attainment is the fact that the, the tests that might be used to uh, foster better learning for the individual child might be slightly different from those if you're trying to spot where there are problems within the education system. And just from what you've said about your international experience, it, it seems that you're uh, making a similar point there. We've got to grapple with the fact that not only do we want to raise attainment for the youngsters involved, but we also have to be able to use uh, the, the testing in schools to be able to identify schools that are needing greater support or local authorities that are needing uh, greater support. Can, can you um, make comment on that dilemma? Because I think it's a very real one in Scottish education. Sure. It's, it's, I think it's the biggest dilemma. So some people think the dilemma is learning versus accountability. And, and, so, and, uh, and where there is that is closely connected to things like parental choice of school, publication of the results and so on. That, that is a big dilemma. Um, for professionals, uh, the, the dilemma is between uh, supporting the teacher with information that would help them to help their students more effectively on the one hand, and, and the need for um, people who can't know all their students but are responsible for them uh, like a like a head teacher of a large school, or a new head teacher who wants some knowledge of where the school is, so she or he can can help lead the school ahead, um, or a, a director of a local authority um, needs and wants some kind of system wide data so they can see where everybody is, uh, and uh, be able to intervene actually and support uh, as as needed if people are falling behind. So the, so the dilemma is actually not with accountability, the biggest one, but, but is with the need for the system to know where it is and, and not be threshing around in the dark, especially if it's a, if it's a larger system. Um, in Ontario, what we recommended 
though it hasn't been implemented because there was a change of government, uh, though it was accepted by the previous government and by the other main parties, so it was accepted by two of the three, par two of the three parties, uh, was to create a kind of firewall between the standardised assessments and the individual uh, diagnostic assessments within, within the school. Uh, just, just like here, we, we do not have total confidence that, that will be, we're on the front edge and, and we're in somewhat uncertain territory. Um, I, I think where the world is moving, and, and you're at the head of this, is I'd say five years ago, systems around the world were in denial that large-scale standardised assessments had negative consequences for students, learning and well-being, and also for the teaching profession uh, re responsible for them. And I think that denial is disappearing very quickly everywhere. And so we're all starting to own, own the problem and say, how can we have large-scale information and also good uh, support diagnostically, formatively uh, for teachers? The Ontario answer was to try and create a firewall and to say the large-scale assessment agency should do this, and they collect the results and about 10 months later, everybody gets to see them and they know where it is and they're useless to the teacher in terms of giving feedback to their children. And at the same time, it will provide lots of support with other kinds of instruments, processes to help teachers with assessment, with assessment for learning. I think the solution being tried here is different, which is to say, uh, how do we use large-scale assessments to inform teachers' professional judgment and uh, local authorities will have knowledge of their schools, um, but local authorities will not be able to compare each with each other on the basis of the test results. It will be on the basis of the teacher's professional judgment, part of which is informed by the test results. So, so this, this is... Um, you, you are on the front edge here for the world. There's, it's good that you're watching the world, but the world is really watching you. And, uh, and, and figuring out to make this a success over the next three years, given the possibility that it may not be, and to be a learning government as much as an improving government, is actually the key challenge, I think. Thank you very much. OK, thank you. Uh, Ms Lana? Okay. Um, I wondered on this question of, of purpose, I mean, it's, I'm not sure if you think it's necessary for the one test to do the two things that you've identified. Would another solution be to have a standardised test which informs the nature of the system and diagnostic testing which supports the child it would be, wouldn't have to be standardised? I wonder, if it, is, this, is it the standardised bit that, that matters? Um, we've had some discussion in the committee around um, purpose and you're probably aware that the OECD review in 2011 really took the view there should be a one clear purpose and that it's complicated if there's more than one purpose. We now have a situation where the Scottish Government says both that it is this national survey and that it is a diagnostic test. Do you think that uh, confuses the issue? Uh, I, I think there is a general principle that many people accept, um, but not all, that, that data collected for one purpose should not be used for another. Um, but, 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 there, but, but the statement there is data collected for one purpose should not be used for another. It does not say data should not be collected for two purposes. I think the, the point is there's a lack of clarity about what the purpose is. The OECD suggests that there should be one purpose. Yeah. We have, what, you know, we can argue why there has been a change, but it, it shifted from being just about having an understanding of what's happening across the system to almost a justification, but it's also a benefit to the child. Do you yeah. think that um, has an impact both on, does it have an impact on the way in which the test itself might be structured? Yeah. Yeah, no, so uh, uh, I think everything you say is, um, is, uh, is, is fair. Uh, they, the, the, the OECD was really, asked, was really saying that the prime purpose of assessment, so if, if you like, the first, the first directive was, was for assessment to support learning. There are, there are really four message systems in schooling, pedagogy, curriculum, assessment, and, and a fourth is a broad area of uh, care and support for the child and their, and, and their development. So, 
Assessment is one of those, and having a deliberate strategy that, that can develop teachers' expertise in assessment to support their students' learning should, should always be the prime, the prime directive. There is also a need uh, at the same time to align those assessments with, with the curriculum, uh, with Curriculum for Excellence, and of course with the National Improvement Framework, and these are like a Venn diagram. So, so they're, they're both important, but they're sometimes somewhat in tension with each other, and we have to be very careful that that if, you know which is the moon and which is the sun, that, that one part of the Venn diagram does not start to eclipse the other. So the Curriculum for Excellence recedes into the background as the National Improvement Framework takes over. And as advisors uh, to Scottish Government, we're always urging them to remain vigilant to keep the focus on both of them. So OECD suggested, uh, proposed, recommended that uh, there, there should be alignment with Curriculum for Excellence and with progress in Curriculum for Excellence. And so you do also need uh, knowledge of whether, whether progress is being made. And at the same time, uh, OECD proposed, and as advisors, uh, we've uh, continued to recommend at every point, which has been accepted if you follow the public domain media on our recommendations, that, um, that, that this moves through a teacher judgment. And so it is not large-scale assessments that have a direct, a direct impact on uh, all kinds of other decisions, but, but they are mediated through teachers' professional judgments. So the theory of change, in a way, going on here is, is that, is that um, it, if there's any aggregation at any point, which there is, it's an aggregation of trying to create consistency in, in teachers' professional judgment. Um, so the judgment is really important, but there's a clear understanding, as we all know, that all, ju all, all individual judgments are flawed. Uh, we're all subject to unconscious bias, um, we're all subject to prefer the people who remind us of ourselves and getting consistency of judgment means that wherever I am as a student in any class, I will get reasonably equal and uh, professional uh, response from, from the teachers who deal with me. So the, the theory of change is this crucial thing, uh, which is different from Ontario, of a kind of buffer of, of teachers' professional judgment between the large-scale assessments that, that the kids take um, on, uh, on the screen and, um, uh, and, and uh, what it is that teachers do in the classroom with their children. That, that's the theory of change, and that is the challenge to make it work. So it, it's different from one ass assessment being developed for one purpose being used for another. It, it is more complicated yeah. than that. But that is precisely what's happening currently is that one has become the other in order perhaps to persuade people that it's a, it's a good idea. I wonder if there's, there's an issue about, and perhaps some international evidence, there's one of the things that's emerged is consistency in actually doing the test. So we're told by the advisors to the Scottish Government that they can do the test at any point during the year. So for example, in primary one, that means you could do it at any stage between four and a half and six. Is that valid? Or would you, would you take the view, as I think some of our panel members did last week, that actually in order for the findings to be informative and valid at national level, there has to be some consistency both about at the stage in the year when they're taken and um, in the circumstance in which they're taken. We're hearing some anecdotal evidence about some teachers prepping the kids for it, others not, you know, all these kind of things that perhaps could be, maybe there are factors that don't matter, but I wonder if you have a view on this, the validity of something when it's not consistently applied. Yeah. So, um, uh, again, that this is, um, as this or any other assessment system unfolds, that they will all contain risks. So, so knowing what those risks are, which you've uh, just uh, uh, covered one of, one of the most serious ones, I think, is, uh, is, is really important. Um, any, any and every system 
of collecting data ab about a child uh, and of aggregating that data is, is imperfect. Um, so I remember at the age of seven uh, the first test I ever took. Probably you may remember the first test uh, you ever took. I was called up to the head teacher's desk uh, to do a reading test. And uh, I remember the last word I could pronounce. I was just, I was P1, actually. I could remember the last word I could pronounce and the first and only word I couldn't when the test stopped. The last word I could pronounce was pneumonia. Um, and I had to give the meaning of it, which frankly wasn't bad for seven. Um, and the, the first word I couldn't pronounce was, I still even can't pronounce it now, was Sithis. P-S-I-T-H-I-S -S. now. Why on earth they had a test but listing two words about pulmonary wasting diseases in successive order for a seven-year-old is, um, is beyond me. All I felt was that this test was very important. What I didn't know until, uh, for sure, until the governors of my school uh, 10 years ago, my former school, sent me class lists of, of when I was in the school, was that the test was being used to decide who went into the A stream and, and who went into the B stream. And, and I had the same class lists of children at 11, which were identical, almost, because we know the evidence from the time is 2%, only about 2% of children transferred. And, um, and, with, and it then listed uh, which secondary schools they went to, and 70% of the A stream went to grammar schools, and 0% of the B stream went to um, for vocational secondary modern schools. And that was all decided at seven, and we know that these tests were flawed, and that the 11 plus was flawed. But then, then we also found that when the 11 plus was abolished or replaced uh, with teacher's judgment, that actually the results of the selection were more social class biased according to teachers and head teachers judgment than they were by an objective test. So the, the, the first thing I want to just reaffirm is, is if, if you're looking for a nirvana of the perfectly consistent way of making judgments or the perfectly consistent way of, of tests, of doing tests, you'll be disappointed. They'll all be imperfect to different degrees and different ways. Um, the, th the thing to avoid, uh, on the one hand, is treating teachers' judgment as individual autonomous judgment. Uh, what we need in the teaching profession, which we've argued about here, is collective autonomy, not individual autonomy. That means we may have more autonomy from the bureaucracy, but we have less autonomy from each other. And, and by looking at the ways we make judgments together, by moderating them, we, we will create some consistency over time. And these data can, can help teachers do that. But, the, but the, da the data will be always imperfect, depending on if you're sick on the day, if you're tired, if, if you do it at the end of the week or the end of the day rather than the beginning of the day, um, et cetera, et cetera. The, um, the risk that, that, you've, that you've outlined uh, with the test, the biggest risk for me of this is not just that it may happen accidentally, but that it may happen systemically. And, um, and, and what that risk is, is if there is undue pressure from Scottish government or undue pressure from uh, local authorities to drive results up in a short period of time to demonstrate success uh, within a period of taking on leadership or before an election, uh, then, then that pressure will, will and does lead teachers to do strange things that are utterly predictable. So, for instance, uh, I could, I could, if I were cynically advising a school now, I'd say if you want to show um, improvement in your results over three years, first, introduce the test without any uh, preparation or professional development. So in the first year, you'll do badly and you'll have an artificial lull for your baseline 
And once you've got a bit of professional development, uh, everybody will do the test better, so you'll have the appearance of an improvement over time. Secondly, uh, in the first year or second year you do this, test all the children early in the year, so you're testing them when you're younger, and a couple of years later, test them all at the end of the year when they've had a bit more practice and preparation and learned a bit more, and then you'll get better results over time. And all across the world, where tests are truly high stakes and punitive consequences can follow, these, ki these kinds of practices go on. You, you cannot really alter that technically much, um, al although it is a good thing to allow differences in time when you take the test because of things like student anxiety and, and readiness uh, and the sense of a dramatic event uh, obviating that and so on. Um, but but the, the way that you deal with these imperfections is really by creating a culture of assessment and a culture of improvement where everybody is genuinely focused on improvement, in, including accepting those moments when you were unsuccessful and you need to identify a different way of moving forward. Okay. Um, my last question, I'm, I'm somebody who sat in a class of 45 and we were literally um, tested every week and we were sat in the desk from 1 to 45th. So you knew if you were the 45th person in the class, not only because you, the mark you got, but because we physically sat in the classroom. I know um, the challenges are some what are apparently objective of tests, um, but also an awareness what a teacher brings into a classroom in terms of assumption. I suppose my question to you is, is there a danger in objective testing that actually what we're doing is reinforcing that? So, for example, um, if a diagnosis or if a test is trying to assess capacity in language and literacy and numeracy, is there a danger that you're reinforcing what children bring into the classroom in, simply in terms of words that they know? It's not that they can't read or they're not numerate, but that they have less... <coughs> Um, less of a richness in the language that they hear at home or in their community. And we are then saying that says something about your literacy. I mean, I think there's some of the questions that I've seen in the test, it, that is a question of whether somebody sat and told you what that word means, as opposed to your capacity to be able to decode it and say what that word is. And it, that in itself matters precisely because what you've said, in the past, people are conscious of their bias, they're trying to deal with it. If you have a, theoretically an objective test which is actually doing the same thing, do you not recognise, or would you accept that that can do a lot of harm? I, I would say absolutely. There's a lot of evidence to support what you're saying, that in a high-stakes or even a mid-stakes uh, scenario, um, when there's a test, say, in uh, primary three, um, and that's the first test people get, uh, kids start rehearsing the words in kindergarten. So, so, so the, the, words, the words they're rehearsing from the first moment they enter school are all geared to preparation for the test. Not so much because of the existence of the test, um, but, but because of the stakes that, that are attached to it in terms of the school's improvement record and the pressure that is placed on it and the interventions that, that can be made. Um, but there is no way to resolve that with, within a census test other, other than uh, lowering the stakes but from, from high to mid and in, and in fact to, to low stakes so that you don't have a culture of fear or anxiety or feeling you have to always demonstrate to improvement or there will be, there will be unwanted uh, consequences. And to build a culture uh, within the teaching profession amongst the head teachers and also in the RICs, the Regional Improvement Collaboratives, um, where, where all leaders um, clearly understand that the, the purpose here is, is to learn and find ways to keep moving forward and, and, and never to create cultures of fear or anxiety that will lead people to contrive the results. A different point I'm making, I think, and I wonder if you can reflect on this, that is not what is taught, not what is practised, but what a child brings into the classroom. So the child can be very competent, very able, um, knows how to read for their aging stage, but there are certain words they will not know because they don't, that they have not come across that vocabulary. And what some of the testing does, I wonder if, if there's danger in this, is you talked earlier about diversity in Canada and so on. 
that actually what you're reflecting as competent readers is somebody who has had access to particular experiences which has given them that vocabulary so that they understand and can respond to that question. How do you take out that bias out of a test and have you looked at the testing regime in Scotland to see whether you think there is some of what is in there is actually bias as opposed to an expectation in terms of skill? I actually took the P1 test yesterday and uh, apparently I did quite well, although I didn't find all the questions easy. Um, so, so at least I have some direct, uh, uh, you know, I have some direct experience, at least of an adult, of what this what this looks like. Um, all tests, all tests, particularly with words, uh, involved are prone to cultural bias. So in Ontario, we found, you know, questions that involve things like appetizers on a menu. Uh, which for children in poverty is just um, you know, something totally, totally outside outside their experience. Um, the, uh, the 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 if you have the test, the way you deal with this is in two ways. Uh, one is one is to continue to review uh, and, uh, and and actually three and modify. Uh, so never feel you've got the test and it's not subject to review and improvement. Uh, secondly, is in terms of accommodations, and uh, you you may want to offer accommodations not just for children with ident with with legally identified needs that bring mandatory statutory uh, supports with them. But, but, but for all children who struggle uh, with their learning in some aspect, or struggle with some aspect uh, of, of their learning, as you know, in uh, Finland, um, by the time you finish school, 50% uh, of you will have been identified as having a special need. It's not a medical condition. It's just a way that you, that, that you struggle with, with your learning. Um, so uh, the, the, those are two of the things. And the third one is... Uh, is 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 the genuine importance of having an array of assessment uh, measures and data and information of 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 which this is simply one that the primacy the primacy all the time must be teachers' judgment and uh, and if it 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 doesn't get there or starts to deviate from there then you're facing the serious possibility that this great experiment will have failed uh, but. But all I would say to you is, is I'd ask you to own the problem that, that two things are needed. One is uh, knowledge to support the child, wherever they are. And two is, is knowledge of how to support the system so that you know the system just as you're responsible for, for Scotland's people. Uh, the head of a local authority is responsible for all the children in that authority. So I'd ask you to own the problem that you, do, that you do need these two things, that they are a dilemma, and and to seek the best way forward to resolve that and, and not deny one or not favour one or over the other and deny the nature of the dilemma. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Gray. Thanks very much, Professor Hargreaves. Now, I thought that last comment kind of got to the, the heart of what the committee is struggling with. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not entirely clear um, what, what your judgment of this is. The, the question I think we're asking ourselves is, the SNSA is these particular tests, for example, the one that you said you did yesterday, can they provide the teacher with the capacity to improve the learning strategies they pursue with that individual child in order to improve their learning, and at the same time provide system-wide information about what the system is doing. Can that test provide both of those things with validity? It, it can. So, so just to remember uh, that the, the test should be, should be considered to be one thing out of all, um, all the data that a group of teachers, so I don't like to think of an individual teacher because all professions are collective, not individual. People, if you can't share your expertise, you shouldn't be in the profession, in any profession. Um, and so uh, when it, this is part of, part of the data 
that should not prevail over all the other data that informs your judgment. You may use other kinds of reading assessments if you're searching for other sorts of reading skills that are not covered by the test. So the test, for example, as I see it, is, is largely about comprehension and uh, re reflects, reflects um, a, a worldwide movement to understand what it is you're seeing in a narrative. It does not test, as far as I can see, um, cre creation of ideas or um, generation of your own sentence constructions and so on. To test that, you would need other kinds of tests or knowledge, in, including, your, including your knowledge of the child. So it will give you some information about some things uh, that are important for you and for the parents and important for Scottish education, but, but by no means all of it. I, 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 that's a very powerful argument, but my question really was, can it provide that data at the individual diagnostic level to be used in the classroom and at the same time provide system-wide information at school, local authority, and in particular, national level and if the answer is it's only one part of the data that we have, would you agree with some of our previous witnesses that it would have made sense, for example, um, to have kept the SSLN survey data, uh, perhaps alongside this, to enrich the data available at a system level? So, um, the, uh, at the individual teacher level, um, what I've seen, which you've probably, I don't know, have you seen the, have you taken the test? Yeah, how did you do? <laughs> Fine. Okay. So, so, you've, so you'll have seen the individual report cards that, 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 that go back. Um, so you, you would, it would frankly need for me like a reading specialist or an early childhood specialist to be able to say is, is what, what worth or value would, would that have to a classroom teacher? Some, some of EIS's feedback, which you'll probably have seen in your testimony, is, is saying that, that in the first year at least, uh, teachers do get value from this kind of feedback and it does help them identify uh, so, some of the ways that, that they can support their children. Um, uh, of course, not all teachers feed, feed not all teachers feed their views in through EIS. They also come in other ways. But 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 it, it's one way of thinking that that some people think it's it's contributing to the kind of feedback that's useful for their for their own students. Is uh, and is that also the the other half of the question you're asking is is on those on those skills that are identified by the test. It it will give you information um, fed into teachers' judgments uh, about how uh, a system overall is moving or not moving over time and how subgroups within that system are, are, are moving or not moving over time. Uh, in terms of the test itself, there'll be... Uh, uh, I'm repeating everything you know. There's, there's national knowledge of the test, but not in ways where the nation can intervene in a particular school or a particular teacher uh, because of their performance on the test. The, the, it comes back over and over again to how do you deal, how do you deal with, with teacher judgment? And um, I may be anticipating a question to come. Uh, professional development, in that sense, should not be seen only or mainly as training courses in how, how to do the test. Uh, that is part of what professional development is, but the research on professional development uh, in the UK and the US shows pretty clearly the best professional development is, is ongoing, it is, it is embedded, um, and it is um, seen as directly related to the learning, and it is collaborative. And, and so if the leaders of your schools and your local authorities are continuously bringing together their teachers to say what is happening to the judgments based on all the data they're receiving, that is what will create the, the consistency that is between the individual feedback and, and the national level trends. So you, you have 
um, made very clear the importance you attach to teacher judgment. Um, and in fact, you said just a moment ago, primacy must be given to teacher's judgment. And you've obviously, Professor Hargraves, reviewed a lot of the evidence that the committee have received on this. Um, and I think it's fair to say, if we look at the evidence we've received from teachers as individuals and collectively through the IAS, <clears throat> there is a very significant judgment there which says these tests do not provide useful information in the classroom for uh, learning and teaching strategies. Should that not be an alarm bell for the committee? I, th I think, I think it, it should be a warning and it should be a way for uh, Scottish Government to consider uh, and to work with ACAR as to uh, what, is contained, what is contained in the tests. If the, skills, if, if the breakdown of the skills are not seen as valuable or useful, then it's necessary for teachers collectively to be able to say what, what, what skills and competencies should be represented in these tests. So um, it, it, it's not a reason to do away with the tests, but it, but it is a reason to say okay. um, what, what kind of tests will be most valid for the skills that are important for CFE. When the designers of the test gave evidence to the committee, I asked them, how teachers had been involved from the start in the early design of the test and they couldn't indicate any involvement from teachers at all. Do you think that's a mistake? Uh, the, sorry, could you just repeat the last part of so what the, you said? So the designers of the tests gave us evidence and I asked about input from teachers in the initial design of the tests and there was none. Do you think that's a mistake? Uh, I, th I think with, with most tests, uh, they do involve teacher participation in the design of the tests. The, um, the danger then is because you think there's been participation, that's it forever. And now the test is validity and reliability tested and you can move it anywhere, anytime to any country in, in any place and it, and it will last in perpetuity. Um, teachers need to feel continuously involved uh, with, with all the assessments that inform, that inform their judgments. So no, it's not just a one, it, it is important to have it as a one-time thing at the beginning, but it is also important to have that continuous loop of feedback. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm, I'm very conscious of time and we have a number of members still to come in. Um, I'm going to bring in uh, Rona Mackay very quickly. Thank you, convener. Um, yeah, it's just kind of kind of in the same, same line of questioning. Um, I wondered if you thought that um, these tests are compatible with play-based learning. Um, you'll be aware that there's a body of opinion that, that thinks they're not and that thinks our children are being tested too much. I wonder if I could have your thoughts on that. Uh, well, for, um, first of all, you need a clear philosophy on, on, uh, and, and stance on what you want your early childhood education to look like up, up to and including uh, P1. Uh, there are raging debates at the moment about, um, and I have people sitting behind me who will have uh, more knowledge and uh, even stronger views on this than than than, than mm -hmm. I do. Uh, but uh, play is an extremely important uh, part of uh, childhood. We know that um, uh, the, the the evidence is emerging now very clearly. Children are spending too, too young children are spending too much time on screens. And I'm not enough time engaged in other things. They're spending too much time indoors, not enough time, not enough time uh, outdoors. Um, they, uh, at the same time, um, privileged parents will read to their children from a very young age, and uh, ch children will have a mastery of a large vocabulary and a range of words uh, from a very young age, and other children won't. And there's huge disparities. And, and that is a fairly strong predictor of, um, of all kinds of indicators of uh, later success, including, um, uh, including rates of imprisonment, unemployment, uh, what you think of here as positive destinations, for example. Uh, so in, in an equal society like Finland, uh, you can, pro where uh, there is more subscription to public libraries than any other nation in the world, uh, you can afford to have a philosophy 
of early childhood that is predominantly about free play in a society that is unequal, where there are huge disparities in access to language, for example, at home, then, uh, then it's important to consider on the grounds of equity um, some areas of play that are more structured and will still be forms of play, but will provide, and I've seen this uh, in Ontario, for example, and, and will provide ways of engaging with numbers or number sense um, that, that are uh, still very playful, very enjoyable, but structured to try and progress children with less behind them when they come to school. Uh, so they have as much chance as all other children. Okay. I, I mean, I totally understand what you're saying, but I'm talking about in relation to these tests, are, are the tests compatible with, we are promoting play-based learning, so you know, can the two coexist happily? And, and do you think that tests at a very early stage are necessary and are they providing value? And going back to Ian Gray's point, you know, what, what actual value can we get from tests at such an early age? So, so they, you know, the, the, the test is a test of literacy. Um, it's not a test of everything that, that, it's not even a test of all literacy. It's a test of, uh, it's, it's a test of comprehension primarily of, uh, of reading. And um, uh, if, uh, if, if developing reading to a certain degree is important within your curriculum, then the test will have some value. Uh, is the experience of a test itself um, incompatible with a with a play-based environment? Um, it, it's um, it doesn't have a lot of bells and whistles. Does does the test? It probably could, um, but but at the moment, apparently, the reason for that is because of broadband width in uh, in some of your schools, and if you have more broadband width, you can have fancier tests that were even more. Are playful and, in, and enjoyable. Uh, even my own grandchildren, possibly people's own children here, will sometimes learn learn maths and other things by uh, doing games on on computer as well as physically playing with with objects. Uh, what what I would say is, al although I'm broadly not in favour of a lot of technology in early childhood, um, a bit of familiarisation with technology where possible in the classroom. So when they take the tests, it's not the first time children face this, would make it seem less like an extraneous event and more like a continuous part of classroom learning. Okay. So just to clarify, um, do you see the current, these current tests as high stakes, medium or low stakes? Uh, the, 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 it is meant to be low stakes. It is at risk of becoming medium stakes. It is not at all high stakes. OK. Thank you. Ms. Gilruth. Good morning, Professor. Um, the 2011 OECD review uh, advised that policymakers can reduce distortion and strategic behaviour by increasing teacher involvement and buy-in from an early stage. So the SSLN arguably didn't do that. I mean, it was a tool for government um, and it didn't empower teachers. And historically, ownership of data in schools seems to have sat certainly in Scotland with head teachers and perhaps deputy heads as well. So I wonder if you might have any examples internationally of training teachers to engage with assessment data in a meaningful way and, and I appreciate you've alluded already this morning to building a culture of improvement perhaps through regional collaboratives. Are there perhaps any other examples we might be able to learn from to empower teachers? Uh, so yeah, so you've asked two questions essentially but, but they're related. The, the first one is on a training for assessment for learning. Uh, of all the message systems I've described which are curriculum, pedagogy, assessment and, and care for young people, it is typically given the least priority amongst, uh, amongst the four. So in Ontario we're facing exactly the same question. Uh, that you've been facing here. Our recommendation, uh, one of our recommendations was for more attention to be given to continuous learning uh, of, of assessment and assessment for learning uh, within the classroom context. Uh, I'd say within Ontario there's been some success uh, because over a period of time with the stability of government, and you can get stability of government in three ways. One is not have a democracy. Um, so Singapore has, doesn't have a democracy as we would understand it, and so has complete stability of government. 
Uh, you can get it by one party being in, in control for a long time, which happened for 12 years in, in Ontario, or you can get it by cross-party agreement and consensus that, in a way, education is above a political infighting, which is pretty much what you have, pretty much what you have in Finland. And in that sense, I would urge you to be to to to, to, be, to be a little more, uh, not to be like Singapore, but perhaps to be a little more, a little more like like Finland. And now I've forgotten the first part of your question. Uh, the usefulness, I suppose, of the SSLN comparatively oh, the, um, for teachers. Yeah, so, so learning a formative assessment. What Ontario has, I think, is over 12 years. It, it has quite successfully uh, built a, a very strong culture of uh, collaborative inquiry um, where uh, teachers together will routinely inquire into problems of practice together within their school and they'll consider all kinds of data, including test data, as part of that inquiry. If I could make a very clear example, um, Ten year, so we've been a, we've been working with ten one seventh of all the school districts on and off for ten years. Ten years ago, um, what when it when the stakes were higher in assessment, and the focus was almost solely on literacy and numeracy, um, and there were consequences for your results not not progressing. Uh, Teach, teach schools would identify what they called marker students. So marker students were students whose scores were just below the acceptable point of proficiency. Here we'd probably say like the level of progression you were supposed to be on in CFE. And, and to get the school up to a good score, uh, school heads would have charts on their walls. We took photos of them that proficiency was number three, and uh, here was your percentage of students on number three, and here was your percentage of students on 2.9, 2.8, and 2.7. And teachers would put all their disproportionate attention into the 2.7s, 8s, and 9s. And when they said, what about the ones and the twos, they were directly advised, uh, forget about the ones and the twos, concentrate on the 2.7s, 8s, and 9s. This was 10 years ago. Now Ontario has broader goals that are much more like CFE, still with literacy and numeracy, but also with uh, well-being. And equity now defined as inclusion, so that you have to be able to see yourself in, in the curriculum. Um, teachers are now addressing the broad range of, of their children's learning, including literacy and numeracy. And now they focus on what they call mystery students or students of wonder. And a student of wonder is a wonderful student who uh, teaches together in the school because they work collaboratively, wonder why they are struggling with a particular aspect of their learning. So the school will bring together the teacher who teaches them now, the teachers who used to teach them, uh, the special education support teacher, the, uh, the language specialist, a school counsellor, a speech therapist, and they'll bring together 12 or 13 teachers to look at this student of wonder and how to advance their learning with all the data that they can bring in, which will include things like photographs of their work um, taken on an iPhone and, and then collected so that everybody can see. So there's numerical data, there's a test score data, uh, there's uh, diagnostic tests, and there's also all the other information that teachers use to inform their judgments over time. They, um, they, uh, the ministry has a very good website that collects lots of materials and instruments that, that you can use. But the main thing is um, the province now has a very good way of what we call mobilizing knowledge and moving the knowledge around within schools and also uh, between them. And, and the districts, at least for several years, work very well together in terms of taking collective responsibility for each other's success and not only for their own success. So the collaboration you saw at the school level was also replicated to some degree at, at, at the district level. That's the first part of your question and I think almost the second part of your question as well. <laughs>
Very helpful, thank you. Um, I'd like to ask a second question just with regard to equity. Um, in a previous evidence session, we heard from uh, Professor Sue Ellis from I think, Glasgow University, who spoke about um, what had happened prior to the standardised assessments being introduced with groups of children, for example, being removed from class. And she argued that that was quite unfair and unequal because you know it created that unlevel playing field, as it were. It singled out children and, and it wasn't fair. Do you think there's an opportunity then with the SNSAs to level the playing field and to stop some of that from happening? Uh, they, uh, uh, the issue of exclusions is always controversial. So um, one of the regrettable things that, that happen in Ontario education is you could be a refugee from Syria speaking almost no English and you arrive on the day of the test and uh, uh, or the week of the test, and the school has to decide uh, whether to uh, enter you for the test, which is humiliating, because you sit there for over an hour trying to make sense of a language you don't know in front of you. Um, or the school excludes you and you score a zero, and the, so the school gets a zero. And of course, the more refugees or students you have with post-traumatic stress in your school, the more zeros are at risk. So it's an impossible dilemma for teachers when you have uh, a test that is mid-stakes on, on one occasion with a kind of dramatic uh, significance attached to it. Um, how you can get around this is by making the test less dramatic by incorporating it in, by it feeling like it is part of the uh, curriculum. And I, I know mainly we're talking about the large-scale standardised assessment, but if you have other kinds of assessment going on as well, children learn that assessment is part of learning. They do peer assessments, they do self-assessments. Assess, they understand that they don't do learning and then there's a thing called assessment, but that assessment is part of their learning all the time, as, as this is as well. And if the test itself is uh, either modified so it can be spoken as well as read if necessary, which in part the existing P1 test is, but not, but not wholly. And, uh, and if you have, which is a resource question, uh, the, the supports available uh, to accommodate and modify uh, people with learning differences so they can access, they can access and express what they know in different ways, then, then, then you do get greater inclusion. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Allen. Thank you, um, Professor Hargreaves. Um, one of the things that was uh, interesting, I think, uh, in what you had to say, uh, amongst many other things, was um, partly about what you were saying about high, low, and medium stakes, but um, it was fairly uh, clear, I think, as well, that um, the, the relevance of of uh, the assessments partly depends on the, the closeness of the relatedness to the curriculum within, the, within which they're working. So I, I was keen to hear a bit more about how you felt the assessments fitted in or, or were helpful specifically to the curriculum that we have in Scotland. Uh, the, the, the P1, so I haven't seen the other assessments, I've only seen the P1 assessment, but I know that's where all the, um, the, all the activity and the interest is at, at, at the moment. Uh, clear, Professor Hargreaves, there is um, an issue about P1 and the government are dealing with that, but the committee is interested in the whole uh, um, testing at all levels throughout the curriculum so, and that's the terms of our inquiry. So, so the short answer is, is I haven't seen the other, I have seen the P1 assessment because uh, I, I realise that's the part of it that just happens to be on the radar. Uh, the, the, the P1, is, the P1 um, literacy assessment is basically an assessment of reading comprehension. Um, and uh, should be consistent with the literacy strategy. Um, is is it, um, it? It is part of what is assessed. If um, uh, curriculum for excellence is about many other things as well as as well as acquisition of uh, of literacy, the test doesn't need to. It, it simply needs to be not inconsistent with those other. It, it needs to not interfere with those other things. And the other ways of judging, for instance, what is the emotional and social development of children um, should also be a very important part of, of uh, how, how teachers assess how the kids are progressing. 
I suppose related to that as well, and it relates too to, to some of your work in uh, Ontario, um, is, is around uh, how we prepare teachers, uh, and it's in a sense, uh, it refers to something I, I think you've, you've said um, uh, in Ontario, which is that uh, the um, Ministry of Education there should implement professional learning and development for educators at all levels of education systems uh, in concert with the rollout of the new assessments. How would you, how would you envisage transferring that advice to Scotland? What, what, what would be the analogous advice you might offer? Uh, well, well, first of all, as, um, as your own review recommendations have uh, pointed out, that uh, I think it's Harriet Watt has had a, what, what seems to be a reasonably well-regarded uh, training programme, if, if you like, for Assessment 101, which is just how you manage the basics of it and understand it and have, have digital competence of your own and uh, uh, develop digital competence amongst the children and know the significance of making judgments at different times about, about when you assess it. That, that, that's, that is professional development as we typically understand it. Um, as important and perhaps even more important than that once you've started moving is, is the uh, professional development for teacher leaders, for, for middle level leaders in schools. Uh, for school heads and uh, deputy heads and and for local authority staff to essentially create a culture of a culture of assessment for learning and indeed assessment as learning so that when I go into any school anywhere for instance um, I can see ways that that children are continuously reflecting on what it is that they do and setting goals for themselves and making judgments about each other's work as well as 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 well as their own work and that teachers are helping them to do that so that teachers understand and children understand that that not only is assessment part of learning but actually assessment is a form of learning and it doesn't automatically happen but it has to be something that you pay conscious attention to and and if you develop that effectively through throughout a system Whenever any instrument or device comes in, um, you collaboratively figure out together your, what your priority is learning, your priority is your shared judgments about learning, not, not, not only your individual judgments, but your shared judgments and getting some consistency of those shared judgments about learning. And then this thing comes in, whatever it is, and a, a strong collaborative culture can take these things, whatever they are, and integrate them into their own understanding of, uh, of, of learning and teaching and, and assessment as it runs throughout school. I'm interested in what creating that culture might take. You mentioned uh, half, and I think probably maybe only a quarter in jest earlier on about the importance of consensus and the importance of political consensus when it comes to some of these issues. Uh, is there more that we could be doing to try to create that consensus, whether it's within the world of politics or outside it? Well, um, I would hope that um, in, in one respect at least, um, Scottish Government could be different than Westminster, which on the issue we cannot name uh, is, um, is uh, more able to um, articulate what it doesn't agree on than articulate what it what it does agree on, and and if if you can attain that cross-party agreement, the the cent the centre, I think everything pivots, not on the technicalities of the test. Everything pivots here for you as 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 world leaders of how to know where your country is going, and how to help all your teachers help your children learn. Is it, it pivots on this thing of teacher judgment. And, and um, Wales, when uh, after devolution, if you've read the what what we found on the OECD report, its first act almost was to abolish the standardised tests, um, uh, but because it it was its way of um, one of the ways of saying we're going to do something differently here than we've been doing it 
under Westminster. So they did abolish the standardised tests and they replaced it with teacher judgments and they were somewhat moderated but not in a very disciplined way and the result was chaos and um, an inflation of uh, great because nobody wants to say they're doing less well this year than they were last year. So, so the improvement just went up and up and up all the time until it couldn't go, till it couldn't go any further. And, and Wales was very clear about what it wanted to get rid of, uh, to have no standardised test, but much less clear about how it would create any kind of consistency uh, ar around teacher judgment. And, and if, if you can find um, ways to uh, at, at least support that quest, even though you might differ about the best way to do it, that, that will be the secret of moving Scotland forward. Thank you, convener. Okay, um, finally, I hope Mr Mundell. <laughs> Well, that's fi finally from me, but I've uh, got just a couple of questions. I'm going uh, back, first of all, to the comments you made around your own experience of testing. I just wonder whether, um, in itself, you know, placing pupils in, in rank order or deciding at a very early stage where they sit relative to their peers inevitably then leads to a different type of bias from the teacher in terms of the strategies they use, how they teach in the classroom. And taking your example, if you teach people um, you know, in, in sets or according to their ability, then does that not just you know, sort of further the, the, the sort of existing differences you know, rather, than, rather than focusing on making sure everyone is getting to, 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 to where I, they can go? I think if, if I can check back with you, I, I, think, I think what you're drawing our attention to is that there may no longer be you know, an 11 plus. Uh, examination, we may no longer put kids into streams at age seven, but we do put them into groups, uh, and we put them into we put them into sets in uh, secondary schools, and um, sometimes into streams. and And the OECD data on this is very clear, uh, which is uh, the higher performing countries um, group by ability select by ability later and the lower performing countries select earlier and the countries with higher equity um, select later and the countries with with lower equity s select sooner um, so uh, then there's a danger in introducing a diagnostic test at age uh, four to, to six uh, that, that, that starts focusing on individual interventions before the sort of pupils, uh, my colleague John Lamont was talking about before, who, who maybe do have yeah. the ability, but, but not the, the knowledge, before they have a chance to, to, to catch up and adjust to, to, to being in that more formal classroom setting. And, and, and again, this is a risk, but it, it's not a risk that's inherent to the test itself. So I'm sure you can probably go to schools now, where if you spend enough time in the classroom, um, you'll, you'll see four reading groups and uh, four or five reading groups, and they'll have names of birds or planets or uh, any kinds of things. And those reading groups are clearly, you know, fast, fast, quite fast, uh, and in the middle, a bit slow and very slow. Um, and, and they work at they work at different levels, and the kids can usually pick up fairly quickly which 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 group is which. Um, the the purpose of any diagnostic test. Is, is, is to, one of the purposes is to group kids in their learning because teachers can't respond with individuals all the time. Sometimes it's a whole class, occasionally it's an individual. Usually teachers work with, with smaller groups. Is, is to, to group children for the most effective ways of instructing them. And a very good area of research on this is cooperative learning. And so, uh, so sometimes you will group children by same ability. Sometimes you'll group them deliberately by, by uh, different abilities. And I don't mean randomly, but I mean you'll have somebody who's a bit further ahead, somebody who's a bit further behind, and they'll work with, it, they'll work with each other at, 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 at different levels. Is, does testing too early and, and, and segregating people based on their ability 
you know, d d d is, 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 is there a greater, you know, is there a greater risk in that early years uh, phase where people's sort of, I, d I don't know what you'd call it, but where they're, you know, they've not, not been given a chance for things to sort of even out uh, or, or, or balance out a little bit so, uh, um, so, in, in, yeah. in that formal education yeah. setting. Yeah. You, is, is there a bigger risk um, in, in diagnostic testing being used to, to decide how to teach? It, it, it all, uh, I'm starting to sound like a broken record, but it, it all depends on the culture of the school. So um, all teachers assess early. Uh, part of your judgment, you know, do you, does this child need a bit of a push? Do you need to hold back? Uh, is a fight going to break out or should you, should you let them work, work their way through it? Um, all these are judgments. They're all assessments. They're all assessments of, 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 of what you know about the children in particular, what you know about children in general from, from the evidence from, from your experience. So we're, we're all always making early assessments. And um, what we, we might assess that, that a child has a difficult for, difficulty forming relationships with other children. And, um, and we need to do something about it. First of all, we need to watch and wait a little bit, but not watch and wait too long before we intervene. And the same will be true in terms of language, for example. So whether your assessment's informal or whether it's formal, it's important to make those. It, you can't possibly teach effectively without coming to those judgments and assessments about children from the very beginning. My question really is, is the risk uh, of the teacher's judgment being imperfect at that early stage greater than the risk of the test producing uh, you know, false, a false positive or false negative? And I think that for some children you know, who maybe haven't had the same uh, ex experience at home, you know, Certainly, having looked at the test myself, having seen uh, you know, seen examples of them done with, with children in schools, there, there are people you know, for whom these tests will inevitably produce a result that doesn't give an accurate indication of their ability for the reasons you outlined. But is it is at an early stage the risk of poor teacher judgment greater than the the, the risks associated with with testing? When a, when a doctor looks at a brain scan, um, the brain scan doesn't speak to the doctor automatically. It has to be interpreted uh, by, by, by the doctor individually and then perhaps collectively. So um, I haven't had a brain scan, but I, I, I fell off the Appalachian Trail six months ago and broke my ankle in two places. I have a plate down the right-hand side of my leg which had uh, 42 staples in it. Um, part of that plate is having difficulty healing. They, um, when I went back to see the surgeon, I saw the resident who was more junior and uh, didn't really seem certain as to what it was, um, and, uh, but was giving advice nonetheless. And so I asked the question, have you ever seen this before? And he said, no. I said, well, perhaps we could have someone in who has. So, so, so I was reminding him that he works in a collective profession not an individual profession. So the next person came in, who is the, the orthopaedic surgeon who actually sawed through my ankle. By the way, they're all men, because uh, in orthopaedics, they think it's basically like being in the basement and um, you're having tools and uh, plugs and everything else. And, uh, and he looked at it, and I said, have you seen this before? And he said, not, not quite like this, but it, it could be this, it could be this. Can I take a photograph of it and I'll send it to dermatology? So then off it goes to dermatology. So, so what, what do they have now? They have the original x-rays, they have a photo of, because uh, we have iPhones, they have a photo of the ankle. And now we've consulted three people and also me. Uh, because I'm treated seriously as a patient. I make sure I put my occupation on the bottom of every email before we connect so that I'm taken seriously. If I was a plumber, they probably wouldn't. And, um, and, and through the mix of those, we come to some kind of judgment together about how to proceed. And we're still not exactly sure. We're kind of still trying to figure out what's best. So all judgment is imperfect, uh, including a photograph or an X-ray, or whatever it might be, it depends on our collective ability to interpret that. If you have a culture where you teach people that the x-ray is gospel, 
uh, and it will tell you what to do. And, and the data will drive you. The, then you're in serious trouble. If, if you're in a culture of leadership where you say, we drive the data, the data do not drive us. It's how we make sense of it, including being critical of it, that matters. Then you have a chance of progressing. Okay, thank you. And then just one final, slightly different uh, question, uh, which which was really just, uh, is, is you talk about improving uh, teacher judgment and, and other things. Is, is uh, standardised assessments where you would start or do you think there are other uh, other things that can be done uh, to, to sort of help, you know, sort of maybe teach people um, around uh, the, the issues that come with bias, um, helping in their training to, to sort of enhance their, their ability to, to spot and identify different literacy problems, or do you think that do, do you think that the, the assessment is the best way to to encourage that collaborative culture and, and, and help people? sort of understand where, where other people are? That, that, that there are many, uh, exactly as you've said, there are many ways of uh, what, whatever our field of improving our, of improving our judgments, and that is uh, referring to our collective knowledge and also referring, to, also referring to outside knowledge that's somewhat independent of, of what, we have, what we have amongst us. Um, but part of the history of what we're looking at now is, is very important, so... Uh, it's public knowledge, but but um, you know, to rem speaking as an advisor now, um, the position that Scottish education was in initially was to have a high state standardised test, um, and as advisors, we we think w whether you like it or not, at least on the nature of advice is you can ignore it. Uh, that the advice we offered uh, was that that would have all kinds of negative impacts on on teaching and learning. Uh, a kind of high stakes, large scale standardised test, and um, but but the, the, the gov your government feels uh, that uh, large scale information is needed in an unequal society uh, to be able to guide it about where best to provide support and an intervention, and uh, so uh, what we have now, what what there is now. Is, is what is meant to be a, a lower stakes assessment that is one of the things that informs teacher judgment and that the main way we will figure out how the system is moving is really by the, the aggregated data on, on those teacher judgments. That, that's the art and the science of how we're trying to get beyond, on the one hand, um, a high stakes large-scale standardised tests with utterly predictable and pervasive negative consequences. And, uh, and on the other, um, no, no standardised testing at all, which leaves us unsure and unclear, which leaves us to the... Um, which leaves us unsure and unclear uh, uh, about the consistency of a teacher judgment across across schools and local authorities. And that's the dilemma, and that's the puzzle. And um, I, I would hope as an advisor, as somebody who's come to love Scotland, uh, I courted my wife in Scotland a lot, um, uh, that um, you, you can help us help you figure out the best way to do this. Do you finally, do you think by going for a compromise between the two approaches that you can actually end up losing the benefits of both, or is that something as advisors we, considered? Uh, we don't see it as a compromise. We see it as a th sort of third way, that uh, that is between between and beyond uh, the the two alternatives that the world has been dealing with previously. Okay. Professor Hargreaves, thank you very much for your attendance to the committee this morning. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time to come along. I'm going to suspend for five minutes if you could be back just before half past while the panels change over. Thank you.
Um, uh, welcome back. Um, can we now move to our second panel on our Scottish National Standardised Assessments Inquiry? And can I welcome Sue Palmer, Chairperson of Upstart Scotland, and Jackie Brock, Chief Executive Officer of Children in Scotland. Uh, and can I thank you both for coming along today? I'm going to ask Ms. Goldruth to open the question. Thank you, and good morning to the panel. Um, I'd like to start with a question today about the previous Scottish Survey of Literacy and Numeracy. And Jackie Brock, in the Children in Scotland submission, you say, we believe evidence from the SSLN and national qualifications provided enough evidence to highlight and track attainment and the attainment gap at a national level. I wonder then if the panel recognises the limitations of the SSLN at a local and at a school level to track pupil progress and also to inform teachers. Um. Thank you. Um, I'm interested that you're talking about the limitations, and I wondered if I could start with potentially some of the um, potential. I know this, you've heard about this from, um, in previous sessions, but for example, in the first year of SSLN's reporting nationally on numeracy, um, what the first year showed us that actually in the early years of primary, children's ability to add, subtract, do basic multiplication and division, showed us that actually nationally we were doing really well. Teachers were doing really well in teaching basic numeracy to children. What was appalling in P4 and beyond was that children were not able to apply that knowledge to more sophisticated concepts, and fractions was the evidence of that. That we were able then to understand the teachers' needs for development in numeracy, so they were very good at basic, but that transfer on to applying that in more sophisticated ways for children needed more attention. And this was across the piece, across Scotland. It wasn't that one pocket of the country was doing brilliantly and the other poorly, across the piece. And that also, that evidence around P4 also helped unpack what was then going wrong above P4 and later into and that all the implications that that has for your aspirations, our aspirations for STEM, um, doing well um, and in maths, etc. So what was then put in place by government, and in fact it had probably been anticipated as well, was a huge range of professional development that could then be applied for every teacher um, to work on their numeracy and demonstrating, because I think you mentioned this in, um, with Professor Hargreaves, that lack of ownership, I agree with you, but actually the opportunity to use evidence about how relevant that national that SSLN was to their teaching in the classroom, in my view, is an opportunity lost. And very, very briefly, I promise, the next, the following year, in terms of literacy, no one was surprised, but it showed us again that teachers were doing really, really well in relation to getting children up to scratch from whatever their background, in relation to basic concepts, but then beginning to apply literacy, um, the, the basic comprehension that you've heard about already with P1. Basic comprehension in terms of a love of reading, being able to talk about what they were learning and articulate it was a huge gap, again, across the country, but particularly for boys. And my question, I think, and, and I think a shared dilemma, is we've dismissed that evidence. We've not followed through in relation to what that evidence told us at national level in ways that could have improved and sustained performance. And I think that's really important for us, isn't it? That the wealth of assessment data and information that we have in Scotland, the follow through, both at individual level, but then at school and um, local authority and government level um, is, is lacking. And I would just say two, two things about that. Um, no local authority chose to enhance the sample of SSLN. What does that say? Mm -hmm. Equally, you've lost an opportunity at national level for you as a committee. If you'd had a consistent tracking of SSLN, or, you know, a national information, but if, let's say, SSLN is the equivalent, you could have had an annual report based on evidence of improvement, and you could have been honing in and where do we need to go in Scotland to improve our education based on real data that is addressing both the individual needs of children in terms of the literacy, but, but critically how we need to improve? And Scotland's lost that. Sue um, Yeah, I, I think 
one of the great strengths of the SSLN was that it didn't cover P1. Um, but I fear that the sorts of results that Jackie was t talking about there may have their roots in early years. Um, and I'm here mainly because I'm very much opposed to standardised testing of children at the age of five, other than developmental testing um, for their general development. What I'm talking about here is actually specifically testing literacy and numeracy at that age. Um, if you focus very hard on them at an age, very early age, as Oliver Mundell has pointed out in his last question, um, many children don't do very well, and then they spend the rest of their lives playing catch-up. If you, as in countries, well, in fact, all mainland Europe, leave the specific test, it's, um, teaching, most of them wouldn't test, uh, of literacy and numeracy skills until children are six or seven, then you've got an opportunity to create the level playing field that we were talking about by focusing in on elements in, in that early stage, like speaking and listening, hugely important and foundational throughout education, not just literacy. Um, children's self-regulation, capacity to control their behaviour and, and settle in a classroom, social and communication skills, which are similarly important, um, learning to focus your attention and control the focus of attention, learning to deal with complex information, all these sorts of skills which are foundational. If we concentrate on those in the early level, which straddles both nursery and P1, rather than homing in too soon on specific literacy and numeracy skills, maybe we would create a better foundation and then you wouldn't get so much of a fall off at P4. Because if children are sort of shaky, if you're building your educational system on a shaky foundation because you're too busy doing the three R's when there are other more important things that we should be doing, then that means that you might look good in the short term, but it won't have long-term good implications. So that's what I think is a strength in not assessing at that particular stage in children's lives. Okay, I'd like to go back to some of the points Andy Hargreaves made in the previous uh, evidence session because he was keen to highlight um, assessment as for learning methodologies, which you know most Scottish teachers will be pretty au fait with. And he spoke about collaboration, about a shared understanding and a culture in schools um, that means that assessment is embedded in learning and teaching. So it's not what he would argue is high stakes. And in fact, he, he argued that SNSAs are not at all high stakes. And Sue Palmer, I note in your submission, you say the SNSA is recognised by the public and media as a key factor and a high stakes policy. So why is Professor Hargreaves wrong? I don't think Professor Hargreaves is wrong at all. Um, I didn't say it was a high stakes. It's a high, I said it was politically high stakes policy, which will affect um, public perceptions of it. And that will affect what's going on in the schools. Because if you're feeling under pressure to improve results, then you're more likely to get sort of the unintended consequences and behaviour that are described very often as relating to testing. Um, sorry, your first point was? Was with regard to it being high stakes and uh, yeah. spoken about assessment as for learning. Yeah. Um, pr Professor Hargreaves talked about Ontario. In Ontario, they do test at P1. They have a developmental test which, well, the equivalent of P1, with children of five, five going on six. It's a, a developmental index. It's called the um, Early Development Index. Um, it's used across Canada, and it's a teacher, an assessment, the kindergarten teacher does it. So she's looking at a checklist of, hang on, what does it cover? It covers, um, I've got it written down somewhere. Social competence, physical health and well-being, emotional maturity, language and cognitive development, communication skills, and general knowledge. The teachers are getting through that a great deal of information about the sorts of developmental factors that are really important at this age. So that could very well enhance professional knowledge if that's what you're wanting to help judge, uh, create a, a background for professional judgment. If you focus instead on just literacy and numeracy, that becomes salient. And literacy and numeracy skills will tend to dominate what people are doing in the classroom. 
and will have the inevitable effect of the grouping that was mentioned earlier and so on. So you can have some sort of testing as long, and that's what I think Professor Patterson mentioned last year, uh, week, that the Netherlands has a test at P5, at P1. Yeah, it's a developmental test. Germany does really very good developmental tests at P5 because it's going to help inform how the, the teachers work. But it's not saying we're doing the, the three R's. It's looking at development. It depends what you look at, what you actually begin to value and discuss and base your professional judgment on. And could I just also point out that the, Professor Patterson said that we've based the sense, I'm sorry, I call it a sensor because that's what teachers call it. I can never remember how to pronounce all the letters. We've based a sensor on um, the curriculum. Well, we haven't. We've based the sensors on the benchmarks. And the benchmarks for P1 are extrapolated from the um, experiences and outcomes. And that extrapolation, I would say, is really quite distorting. There's 54 of them for literacy. 22 out of 54 relate to speaking and listening, which I would say is by far, I mean, that's nowhere near enough. Um, speaking and listening is the big thing. 32 relate to specific literacy skills. And I would disagree with um, um, Andy Hargreaves um, because I've look, been given a demonstration of the P1 sense uh, too, and I'd say that it does uh, cover a lot more than comprehension. It covers things like um, phonological awareness, word building, letter recognition, word recognition, and so on. I would say of the 54 benchmarks, it covers about 10. It seems to me to be distorting completely what the curriculum is. And even the existence of the benchmarks without the test will distort teachers' impressions of what the experiences and outcomes are. If you look at the actual original ones, it's words like explore, play, discover, choose and develop. These are major verbs. Once you drill down and turn that into specific tasks, you're getting away from a holistic developmental approach to early level, which is what Curriculum for Excellence was about. And you're moving much more to a really drilled down <laughs> skills-based one. And if they look at the benchmarks rather than the ENOs, which I suspect they will, then that's going to affect the um, achievement of curriculum for excellent levels assessments as well. Sorry, on you go. Sorry, um, I'd just like to go back to consider then, if we're not looking at Ontario, if we look at what's happening in Fife, where, where um, I represent my constituency. So the Durham CM assessments are going to be brought back in Fife, um, arguably, you know, due to the politicisation of the SNSAs, which you alluded to at the start of your answer there. This is going to cost the local authority up to £100,000. But because more than a half of primary one pupils have not sat the baseline PIP assessment, we can't just shift back. So instead, the Durham assessments are going to be used alongside the SNSAs, potentially doubling the assessment load on pupils. I'm frankly appalled at that as a former teacher. Um, so I'd like to ask if both Children in Scotland and if Upstart were against the previous Durham assessments. Yes. You were? I'm against specific skills-based assessment of literacy and numeracy skills. I am not against developmental assessments and checklists which are looking more holistically at children's development and can very much inform any sort of intervention that might be needed for specific children. It's once you start testing on literacy and numeracy skills, that becomes what need, gets done in the classroom. So, absolutely opposed to the other sorts of specific assessments as well. Jackie Rock? We're not opposed to any diagnostic formative assessments at any age um, throughout Scotland's education. Um, we are opposed to standardised assessment when it's used to um, measure and shape individual children's performance and individual teaching strategies in Scotland for all the reasons that were set out by Andy Hargreaves in previous evidence and critically I think Professor Haywood's point around backwash. Um, the 
pressures on politicians, local authorities, individual teachers, and children in relation to how high stakes and uh, I think some of the semantics around this, if it gets into the press, if freedom of information requests are used to measure individual schools and therefore individual teachers um, and used in order to shape performance, then we've got a huge problem um, in, in relation to how we consider um, Scotland's education. And critically, um, they are not yeah, critically, um, they will shape behaviours, and I'm not satisfied, children. Scotland's not satisfied, our members are not satisfied that assurances by the current Scottish Government that have been made, that have, have changed, and, and um, they've shifted the, perform the, the um, approach that's being taken now to SNSA, and that's very welcome. But unfortunately, I think the die has been cast in relation to um, how these are going to be used. Um, possibly not by Scottish Government at the moment. But once there's more pressure, the latest PISA results that show a problem, there will be more pressure applied on to various, um, the local system on Scottish Government to reveal more about what we know. And I think there's a really real danger that the information that will be formed and judged and used from SNSA will become distorted. And it'll be out of the government's hands, in my opinion. Okay, so if we just go back to, I appreciate what you were saying, Supama, with regard to being against the Durham assessments, but if we follow what Fife has done, which is to get rid of SNSAs and to go back to that system, um, under the previous system, children could be removed in groups from class, and I made the point to Andy Hargreaves that Professor Sue Ellis had previously raised, which was about equity and about you know singling out individuals and removing them from class. Surely there's an opportunity with the SNSAs to stop that kind of behaviour from happening and to create a more level playing field for all children. I don't see how, because if you're actually, there is a huge, the point about early level is that it's a stage in children's development when there's massive variation in terms of what they'd be able to do in terms of stuff like literacy and numeracy. It's been pointed out that that can be to do with previous experience and the sorts of richness of experience they've had in their um, home family background and so on. But it's also to do with individual genetic predisposition. Some children actually click learning how to read later than others, to put it simply. Um, so what you've got to do in that, that early level, and I think the, the point of curric curriculum, I adore curriculum for excellence, um, because I think early level especially was trying to nudge the Scottish system away from this going in heavy on the three hours early as soon as P1. It, it is a developmentally appropriate stage, uh, much more like the sort of thing you'd see in Northern Europe. And Unfortunately, it's never really taken off because we're stuck in a sort of cultural habit of starting the three hours early. What horrifies me is that we actually had begun to move. We're beginning to see some schools um, starting to move towards play-based pedagogy, developmentally appropriate pedagogy in P1. But the, the introduction of the sensor will just kill that in its tracks because it puts the focus firmly back on get on with the literacy and numeracy skills. Crack on with it now. Um, so do you think that will stop play-based learning from happening? Because yes, I, that's think not that, my, yes well, I would say they are inconsistent. If, if, I'm not saying that you can't be playful in your learning and put some elements of play-based learning into a, a classroom where you are have groups working on literacy and numeracy skills, because those groupings will have to happen. I, I see them in every school I go into. If you're trying to address literacy and numeracy skills this early, um, th yes, that you can get a sort of hodgepodge like that. But if you are trying to provide a genuinely developmentally appropriate stage, then that you, you know, testing just would skew it, will skew it away from being relationship-centred and play-based. Um, okay, well, when, when, can when I just ask, not... just lastly, sorry, convener, what's your evidence base for that? Because I, I visit schools regularly um, in my capacity as an MSP, and I was in a classroom uh, previously not that long ago. It's certainly not my experience that's what happens in our schools. So what's your evidence base for that assertion? Well, um, simply that every school, like, same with you, really, that every school I know has reading groups. 
and they don't have any play-based learning? Oh, no, I don't say they don't have any play-based learning. I said you can have a consistent, you can have some play-based learning and you can have reading groups. But the very fact that you've got reading groups indicates that it is not um, early childhood education which is based on development and on supporting every child at their own individual developmental level. That is the ethos of a kindergarten. That is the ethos you see in Finland and in Germany in kindergartens. Um, they're not saying, oh, well, we've got a standard of what we want in literacy, so everybody's got to work to that standard. They're saying, no, we support the child at the stage it's at, and we create a supportive environment, a literacy-rich environment, we have particular attention to things like speaking and listening. We are looking at how well children are learning to focus attention. All those other things are going on as well. And indeed, in the Scandinavian countries, a great deal of emphasis on self-directed outdoor play, which, as was mentioned earlier, is disappearing from children's lives. Um, when we started Upstart, we actually, it was before the tests began that we got talking about it. And it was nothing to do with literacy and numeracy. We were interested in reinstating play in children's lives and having a, a, a ring fence period when that became very, very important. So it, it's not that you can't have playful activities or games. You can. And you can turn those into lessons in how to do recognition of words or <coughs> sound symbol recognition. But that is aiming to a standard rather than a genuinely play-based um, environment in which children are gently supported at whatever level they themselves are. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, Ms. Mackay. Thank you, Convener. Um, good morning. Um, I'm interested in what you say that you're, you're not opposed to um, assessments when, uh, depending on the nature of them, if it's for developmental purposes. So if guidelines, for instance, went out to schools and um, local authorities to say that these tests were not to be used for um, streaming children or, you know, for uh, as a benchmark for their future learning, would you be content with that if, if, if monitoring was done to ensure that that wasn't happening? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm interested to, to know what evidence you have that it is happening, um, but um, would that, you know, would that allay your fears or is it the entire nature of the test that you don't like? Um, I'm not sure that it would allay my fears because I'm not sure how easy it would be for teachers to do that. If you are... As, as we've said, once you've got tests, the sorts of things that are on the test do become salient, and that does affect the way you teach. If you're trying to teach P1, actually it'd be very, very difficult to cover the sorts of things that are in the test in terms of the specific st skills without actually grouping. Because you've got 25 children in a classroom, and these things take a lot of sort of sitting down and helping them understand and particularly in the less able groups, the, you know, it, it, you've really got to keep on and on and on and repeating it. So it, it's very time consuming um, and therefore the grouping helps a lot. So I don't see how, um, if this is what we are aiming to do, concentrate on literacy and numeracy skills, specific ones in early level, I don't see how the teachers can avoid using groups. But well, I, it's probably good yeah, I mean, I, I don't have a teaching background, but you know, would it not be possible to um, to have that information, to have it there for you know, so that you've got it noted that that you know, the, the results of that test, but didn't actually stream children or, or group them it, and just not, and, and leave it to a later level to say how much to, are they progressed with it's that not much? so much the results of the test i mean it's actually the existence of the test that is is that, that affects what happens in a class in a, an early an early year 
level and, classroom. And, and, but you're the in favour of, 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 of de developmental tests, so would that not do the same oh, thing? Oh, no. Well, developmental tests is what you're interested in. You're interested in that overall holistic development. And in fact, that EDI thing that is used in Aust Ontario, um, in, across Canada and across Australia, that I described earlier, has been piloted in East Lothian um, and has been validated for Scotland um, on the basis of that. But it never actually reached parliamentary level, I don't think. I think it stopped at civil service level and, and, at the t and it was roughly around the sort of time that the idea of introducing standardised tests of literacy and numeracy came in. Um, so just come back to my original question, if guidelines were put in place to ensure that these weren't used for purposes that, that, that you don't believe um, they should be, um, then that would, surely that would, you know, be better in, please, in, uh, from please, your side. I've, I've, I've said I don't think guidelines actually can work in these circumstances, uh -huh. but Jackie. Um, Jackie. Thank you. Um, I think obviously you've talked a lot in previous evidence sessions about the purpose of assessment and, and the ranges of assessment. And I think in terms of guidelines, I suppose we need to be mindful of the amount of guidelines that are out there in relation to, to, to how teachers should be practicing. So we've got to be very thoughtful about that. And what I would suggest is thinking through again, and, I, and I, you, you're obviously um, exercised greatly about the purpose of assessment. I think we need to look back at um, Scotland's you know, really strong legacy of thinking about assessment is for learning and the points that um, Professor Hargreaves made about culture. Now, we've had a remarkable cross-party um, agreement and political agreement nationally and locally around what we want for assessment. I won't repeat it at length, but 2005 Assessment is for Learning guidelines stressed the importance of teacher judgment supported by a range of assessment tools that would be decided locally. And critically, the importance of teacher judgment and moderation around that, because we all recognize the understandable um, uh, um, preposition for, for bias. And we all understand that professionally, teachers want to be able to check out with their peers and get support about, what, about how they can support the progress and improvement of, of their pupils. Of course they do. Then, that was 2005, and a huge amount, probably some of you benefited from the professional training that went on in Scotland, fantastic developments there. And all of those principles were reinforced later in 2011 under building the curriculum. And a really strong amount, um, a reinforced pressure around moderation. And I'm, in terms of us thinking about purpose of assessment and the guidelines and what are we actually doing with the information, I think it's really interesting but frankly disappointing that we're not hearing about the thriving moderation that is going on in Scotland. What, where is the moderation and the discussion at school level and the thinking about what are we hearing about, about assessments in our school and what, are we, what successes do we have and how are we building on that improvement? What about the moderation that we're hearing uh, and are we hearing at thematic level? Now, we hear a lot of amazing work being done at school cluster level around STEM because in order to improve, teachers in STEM know they need to check out and, and, work, and work on standards to improve. And that's, that's happening, um, and at cluster level. But I, I think there is a failure of confidence in the system at local authority and national level that this is actually good enough. And that's what I think the genesis of, the, of SNSA was. And therefore, I wonder, sorry to go back to your question, um, Within all this, we've had a, if you like, we've had a really settled political, national and professional understanding of the purpose of assessment. We've then, we, and then we have a really legitimate and important and powerful requirement in our education system that we must remove inequality. And for some reason, we've decided that the, um, uh, valuing of teacher judgment and how we strengthen teacher judgment and moderation, how we strengthen assessment, how we build on our learning strategies, we've somehow decided that actually, no, actually, we don't believe in all of that. SNSA, the standardised national assessments are the way forward about how we'll remove equity. Now, I think we heard some powerful arguments about maybe that, why that is. But it doesn't seem that we've, we, it does seem that we're now lurching to a new way of, of looking at assessment. Um, 
that is standardized and that is proved, I think, internationally, you've got a huge range of evidence to suggest that it won't work in a high stakes environment. And I worry that um, guidelines just around the use for tests, when you've already heard that they can't be standardized in terms of the timing of the tests, that, they won't be, that the information won't be known and in a standardized way at national level or even between authorities. So what, is the, what are the guidelines then? How are they going to be used? How will teachers be trained and, and, and supported and their development supported that guidelines actually all of a sudden reveal clarity about how they can use this information in order to improve their teaching strategies? I feel the guidelines, there's an opportunity through this committee's inquiry to maybe go back to some basics around assessment and then think really carefully about what really standardised assessments could offer, if anything, as opposed to um, measures that we've been using for some time. Okay, thank Sorry you. to go thank on. You. Thank you. Smith? <clears throat> just, just on that point, I, I think that's a, a very interesting, very powerful argument you've just put. Could I just ask, uh, in terms of uh, international evidence, I mean, the, the, the big thing that I think troubles local authorities and troubles many politicians and certainly troubles many parents is if, if a school is seen to be requiring more support, it's not doing as well as it could be, or there's a particular uh, local authority that's not maybe performing very well on what it's been able to achieve in the past, what kind of data do we need to have in order to help these schools do better and local authorities do better so that we can raise attainment. Because I think if we do look at lots of the international measurements, you know, Scotland has not been doing as well as it might have been, and that's a worry. And therefore, to try to use some of that data, I think, to improve things is, is what we're driving at. And I'd just be interested in your views on that. So I, I hope um, everything in our evidence and appearing today makes clear that um, all of children in Scotland's members and us, we want to absolutely improve the performance from what is, 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 a, is a good performance at the moment, but must get better, and, and there are areas of, of some decline. So we do have qualifications, and we do have PISA, um, and these are really important um, in ways that they begin to, for example, the fractions argument I gave earlier and our performance around um, mathematics and STEM, we, we, we can use some of the qualifications and where we're going wrong in some of that potentially to unpick further down the chain in terms of it, to actually say we're not getting some basic concepts of, of applying maths for um, numeracy into mathematical concepts, so we're not using the information that we already have. We also have benchmarking within um, Scotland. A huge amount of money has gone into supporting schools to cluster with schools with similar socio-economic characteristics. So you can cluster that. You can look at why are certain schools performing better or worse than others with similar characteristics, and therefore how you can learn from those that are doing well. Into primary schools, you again. There's been this kind of. Um, frankly, myth in my view, that there is nothing. Yes, there is nothing if, uh, until now, potentially, that will help you compare um, in order to hone in on poorly performing schools. But there is plenty at local authority level where there is assessment, standard, uh, standardised assessment at local authority level that 31 of the 32 authorities bought into. So I'm sorry, it is impossible for me to find credible that any local authority director of education does not know how well um, and comparatively well or badly their schools are doing and therefore where they need to hone in on supporting those schools at year level as well to do better. Um, I think a real issue that I don't think has been touched on sufficiently, if I can say so, around the evidence um, is, so what do we in Scotland do with the evidence in order to tackle in poor performance um, and to improve children. And, and I think, again, that is a legitimate concern of government and why they have initially at least claimed to have introduced SNSA, that they did want a tool to look at how you improve performance. And that's legitimate. I would disagree about the means, but there is plenty of information. I think what you, we do have is to be concerned about is the apparent um, um, in, inconsistent way in which we are 
improving performance across Scotland at the thank local you. level. Okay, Ms. Lamont. Okay, thank you. Um, I wonder if I can um, ask in two areas. First of all, on this question of purpose, um, there's clearly been a, a, a shift in what the purpose of this, the assessment is. Started off as get information across Scotland and then it became a diagnostic thing. Which of either of these purposes would be the better? And can SNSA testing fulfil either of them? Um, well, I've just written down purpose on when you were speaking because I think that what the issue for us in terms of the P1 test is that we've got the wrong purpose. The purpose of assessment for early level should be children's holistic development. The purpose for testing in sensor is standardised um, standards in literacy and numeracy, assessing children against specific standards. The two things are at odds with each other because if you are assessing development, that is a holistic process. It takes in things like social competence, physical health and well-being, emotional maturity, language and cognitive development, communication skills and general knowledge. It is not specific literacy and numeracy skills. So for me, as far as the early level is concerned, we've just got the wrong instrument. It's just not appropriate. Okay. And what would you say to the person who says you can't change what you don't know? Um, I would hope that we would be using that developmental information to help improve, because we would know stuff about children's development. I mean, it's, it's issues like not not just um, the, the the background that you have mentioned, and we know about you know we can know about that and know that we need to provide literacy rich environment, plenty of stories, lots of opportunities for songs and rhymes and that sort of thing. But it's also things like um, speech and language difficulty. If you spot that, then you can pick that up and try to help with it. Issues with phonological awareness, children not actually hearing rhyme perhaps, then you, you want to look at aud audiometric testing. Maybe some children will need other physical checkups like visual check. This is the sort of thing that they're doing, they do in Germany as a regular thing when children are five. A physical um, and cognitive assessment that will help them ensure that you are putting the right sort of support in at the individual level for each child, okay. if necessary. So, again, if I were the devil's advocate, um, the kind of characterisation is, and I've seen it in one professional life, what I would call the dismissive shrug. Well, they come from such and such a place, we can't expect any better. And a sense that in order to address inequality, we need rigour. And these standardised assessments offer rigour that wasn't there before. How do you address that question for families, um, for schools, for teachers who are anxious that young people are already disadvantaged when they come in the door? And if we don't have rigour around understanding through assessment, are they being treated as seriously as children in another school? Are they getting the same opportunities? Is there the same kind of rigour around their learning and not the lowered levels of expectation, which is some of the characterisation around this debate. How do you respond to that? Because I think that's probably one of the most compelling arguments that, that the choice is between rigour and treating every child with respect and therefore testing and understand their ability against something that's indefinable, it's nice, it's warm, but we may be disadvantaging these children. How do we respond to that? Respond to it by saying that if we are keep it, uh, doing genuine developmental testing, which at the moment we're not, um, then we would be being very rigorous in terms of the appropriate sort of rigour for that age group. Um, that age group in the vast majority of the world, including the whole of mainland Europe, wouldn't even be in school, let alone being tested in the three R's. It's just because we have this cultural attachment because of very, very early school starting age, which we've had for 150 years, and we've therefore sort of assumed that it, go in at P1 and you crack on with literacy and numeracy. Some children will be fine in literacy and numeracy at P1, and yes, you support and encourage them. 
Some children won't have the foggiest, and they will need a different sort of a support and encouragement, and hopefully a very rich environment in which to make the progress. Um, so that you have got a much more level playing field when you do begin specific instruction in skills. It is not in any way not rigorous to be looking at children's development rather than saying, let's just get on with aiming at standards. The point at which standards kick in is the significant one. And indeed, looking at the international um, evidence on when they do standardised assessment. The first standardised assessment in most countries is not before the age of 10. National standardised assessment is not before the age of about 10. Um, and Singapore, where they had been, they, they don't start school till six, but they have been testing at six. They've just abandoned it and aren't going to do any testing until after the age of eight, because they've realised that it is actually corrupt, um, changing the ethos of early years education in a way which is not productive for the children. There's lots of different sorts of rigor. And if you talk to people who are specialists in early childhood education, they are very, very rigorous indeed. But it just doesn't look the same as sitting down and doing the three Rs. OK, um, but just, I mean, I think Children's Scotland are opposed to standardized testing at every level. So you can see perhaps the argument early years, but um, I wonder if there's, what is the argument later on? So I think um, in terms of our um, response around standardised assessment, we were certainly responding in the context of the, um, the way in which it initially been proposed in National Improvement Framework that was around looking at ways in which we can judge performance of schools and local authorities in relation to um, and, and how that information would be used in relation to those um, systems that were poorly performing and badly performing. And then, and the reason why we were concerned about this is the evidence has been well documented in relation to the distorting behaviours that um, come about as a result of, um, of, of that high stakes testing. I think the, we want to stress that we understand the purpose of assessment. We understand the needs to look at ways in which local systems, local authorities and schools work together to look at moderating um, performance and making sure that that's a robust approach to um, that isn't just about sitting around having a coffee and oh, look at these results. It's a challenging approach to how we can demonstrate at cluster level or as I said, at subject level or whatever, um, that there is improvement. And I think that's probably a prob that is a problem in relation to that robust approach that um, teachers are finding difficult. I don't know if it's at head level or subject specialist level, that, we're, that maybe there isn't sufficient robust professional development going on. Um, so it was that sense in which we might revert simply to using information that I think is acknowledged that is a tenth of the literature. In, in um, one of the um, evidence sessions, you talked about a tenth of the curriculum in relation to um, literacy and numeracy being covered by these tests. Now, if that is that, there is the potential, I would suggest, of distorting all other efforts around literacy and numeracy. Um, may I just, um, Deputy Convener, say a little bit about the purpose as well that you talked about assessment? Because very briefly, I, I feel um, that it's really important to also bring in, if I can, sort of what children and young people have said. And I just wanted to quote from some work that we did for the General Teaching Council of Scotland, where we worked with 591 children and young people from 5 to 18. And I think when you are going to be reflecting on purposes of education, I think firstly it's really encouraging to reflect that um, the Scottish guidance around assessment is for learning and building the curriculum five guidance, it's actually reflected very much in what children and young people say they want. So very briefly, of course, key to helping them develop and learn is positive relationships. But specifically, children and young people want to be able to focus on, on to help them, what did I do well, what didn't I do so well on, and what are the next steps for their work? They wanted, the children, young people want positive, short-term learning goals. They want achievements that they can reflect on 
and discuss regularly, one-to-one -one or in groups. They don't want assessments that are essentially memory tests. They don't feel that's helpful to their learning and development and progress. Um, they want, and here's some direct, just two direct quotes if I may, convener, um, if I make a mistake, they explain what I did wrong and they help me to understand for next time. They help me focus on what I do best and make, make us learn more about what we, we don't know. And I know, Deputy Convener, you've been talking about the needs of children with additional support needs. And of course, there's potential greater variability for the whole range of children and whole range of needs that, that may be additional. And the extent to which some assessments can be modified and, and adapted and tailored for the individual needs of children, additional support needs children, care experience children. I know you have a significant interest there. Children with particular health and um, mental health conditions, for example. These need tailoring, so they need a combination of teacher judgment, of course, backed up by tests and assessments that can actually be modified and shaped to ensure that the teacher is getting it right in relation to how um, they can help support a child's learning, but really critically, their progress onto next levels. And I think that I really would make a plea that some of that, those findings, which we can make fully available, that voice, if you like, of children and young people, that echoes national guidance will, will, will be reflected when you're reflecting as well and recommending around purposes of assessment too. Thank you. Um, very much for that. I was going to ask one last question, but it's gone out of my head. Um, perhaps if I can come back in when I remember it. <laughs> okay. Um, could, could I just ask in particular, um, so um, Jackie, you've talked about it being a high stakes test, but if, if I understood you correctly, and I may have, got, I have, I have a, a note picked you up correctly, um, that the 31 and 32 authorities were using um, Durham tests, CAT tests, and, and, and using that. And, uh, why aren't those high stakes? Um... Um, sorry, Sue, shall I just very brief? Um, well, I don't know if you're a parent, but my children have just gone. Did you ever know that those assessments were happening? No, I didn't. No, but I do now, so the yes. genie's out the bag. Indeed, neither do I. And the genie's out of that. Isn't that uh -huh. an interesting expression? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, because the genie's out of the bag, and, and I think I understand the, um, if you like, the um, bureaucratic definition of high stakes, mid stakes, low stakes. But when the genie's out of the bag, and when parents have information that, that can help them say, is this, is, is my child here, there, or wherever, when the local press can, when councillors, when ministers, when your committee can, we've become high stakes, haven't we? So I think. We need, and I think Professor Hargreaves um, talked about this, if we're really clear about purposes um, and we're clear in terms of translating purposes into the daily experience for children that we can then report to children and their parents and in time to the media, then um, we can help mitigate the impact of those high stakes. I don't think the discussion around SNSA has been helpful so far because the genie's out of the bag. Um, or even the bottle. Um, but I think we, um, I think what hopefully you can do in your committee is to try and um, dampen down some of the concerns about how, um, if standardised assessments do go down, really the the authenticity of how they're going to be used and how they're actually helping um, teacher judgment. I think there's a long way to go before that feels credible. Um, and how we have an honest conversation about how teacher judgments are being used to think about the progress both of individual children, but how our school is performing and how our local authorities and government is performing in terms of investing where we need to. I, th I, think, I think this could maybe lead to a more healthier conversation, but I do worry that if we're only then going to focus on the results of SS and SNSA, and we've really lost a huge opportunity to, to, for us all to understand the importance of, of improving performance. Uh, and I just, just very briefly, having worked in Scottish Government and seen the maelstrom of panic and concern that arises from the annual publication of data that, frankly, the media and politicians all collude in and distort potentially really good work that's being done at schools, I feel that we, we need to be so cautious about 
the impact of, of, um, of high stakes testing um, and assessment and how we then use those results nationally. I, I understand. I that, sorry, that, sorry, totally yes. In course, terms of P1, mm -hmm. that genie out of the bottle thing is particularly significant because the ratcheting up of parental anxiety um, impacts on the children. And within a year of um, the announcement that we would be testing P1 children, the workbooks had already appeared in the bookshop, you know, help your child with primary one literacy, help your child with primary one numeracy. And as soon as they get wind of what's on the actual tablet-based tests, I dare say there will be apps. And this is, this is a, making it very high stakes in terms of what's happening in P1, which is why it's something like a, 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 a developmental checklist which is done by the teacher is a much, much less um, distorting mm -hmm. thing than something which is linked to testing throughout the school system and is very, very specific to particular um, literacy and numeracy skills. So um, we've heard lots of evidence about how helpful the uh, testing that was done previously in some Local authorities have decided to continue their own testing, like East Renfrewshire and Fife have re um, reverted back to using that original one. Have we kind of poisoned the waterhole for what that was <laughs> in terms of how the perception will be for that testing going forward? I think that, now that people it are has aware. raised the whole question. And uh, I, I, I did do a piece with Skeptical Scott recently saying that I hope that this is going to start a national conversation about what is relevant in that early level and what we whether we should be thinking in terms of you know getting on with the three r's or whether we should be looking at a different sort of approach because um it could be that we have um revealed that the water is poisoned okay okay is anyone else uh, just sorry joanne you had just a quick supplementary a, a short yeah. brief amnesia has has um, I've recovered. Um, there's, as you know, there's been a lot of argument around this debate, and a lot of some of it's been quite heated. And I would say the argument made for SNAs that gave me most pause was when, I think both at government level and probably just in the political debate, it was said, if you had a child with special educational needs, you would want to know. And if we don't, th this is a means by which we do know that, and surely you're putting these young people at risk if we don't have rigorous assessment. You can understand how compelling an argument that is to anybody who's thinking of perhaps this is not um, the best use of a teacher's time or whatever. What is your response to that? Because that's always a very serious um, s statement to say these tests ensure that we identify early young people with additional support needs and we can therefore meet those needs. I think in many cases what we're doing is creating some of the additional support needs by um, very much focusing on these specific skills at a very early age. Um, I worked for a long time with dyslexic children and it was very clear when they came to me that for many of them it was an auditory issue or a visual issue at the beginning, something like that. But because they were being asked to you know, do sound symbol recognition that they couldn't do, there was an emotional overlay which then grew and then they felt the stigma of being in a remedial, um, I mean, we don't talk about remedial groups now, but in a special group doing some special works, Sue Ellis talked about the walk of shame at the first meeting of this committee. Um, the children develop more problems as a result of having been asked to perform these tasks when they were not developmentally ready to do so. It creates the needs. What we need is developmental checklist, developmental assessment. Some, in order to inform policy and, and um, funding to particular areas in terms of the, thing, the, the needs they have, but also so that teachers, by becoming familiar with the sorts of things that, that are being covered, their judgment of the children is better and they're able to look for, when you see a child that you're a bit worried about, who do we refer them to for the best diagno diagnostic tests? That's the way it works in Finland, and they have far fewer special educational needs because a lot of them are picked up through 
teacher judgment, proper diagnostic tests on the individual child, um, putting forward together uh, sort of support packages so that by the time they actually start school, the problem's been sorted out, rather than building up an emotional overlay on top of everything. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Key. In uh, Upstart's uh, submission to the committee, there's a reference made to NAPLAN, the, the Australian system, which says that similar uh, low stakes, labelled low stakes tests were introduced, um, but the information was then used in a high stakes way and uh, is now acknowledged to have had the unintended consequences of that kind of testing. And I wondered if you could just enlarge on that slightly and also ask Jackie if that was the fear she was describing when she talked about information becoming available through FOI or otherwise? Yeah, I think the, the, the genie out of the bottle argument is very much at the back of that. Once you do national standardised testing, it's public knowledge, it's, it's of great interest to the public. Parents become anxious, teachers become anxious that they make sure that their classes get through. Schools are worried about their results. So, yeah, the NAPLAN tests don't begin until year three. Um, but interestingly, the, um, I said that the early developmental in, in early development um, instrument is being used in Australia as well as in Canada. Interestingly, its results did correlate rather well with the year three results on that plan. <laughs> so a developmental check is as, as good at predicting what would be happening at year three as anywhere else. And um, for me, um, Mr. Gray, I think, I think um, so. The the fractions argument um, is is if I can go back to that and maybe a couple of others. I think it's absolutely right that the public, um, the media, Parliament, is engaged in a debate about how we need to improve teaching and learning, in in order to um, improve the the outcomes for our for our children. Um, in relation to, and that can only lead to a deeper conversation. And I think um, SSLN meant that we were looking, if you like, at um, rather than blaming and wagging our fingers at individual schools or teachers or children from a particular um, part of the country, instead of doing that, we were actually saying we've got a systemic challenge here and here's how we are going to address it. And there's a whole range of things that families and others can do to help us. Um, but we could have really helped in a very high stakes way um, uh, deepen our understanding of how we improve and move the conversation on because the way in which the, um, the, the SSLN findings were is that our teachers are rubbish and our children are pretty rubbish too because they can't do sums. Well, no, it was a systemic issue around the application of basic colleagues. And I think essential and so i've got no problem with that and i think we would all benefit wouldn't we from a really better informed high stakes if you like discussion around how we're going to improve scotland's education um what i really want to resist are the well documented um impacts on individual schools on individual neighborhoods on individual types of children with particular needs of ways in which we've seen league tables or some fancy way of, 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 of uh, presenting the information about when children appear not to be performing well, based on what we all know is SS, SNSA or whatever, the Durham assessments, is a very narrow um, a tool. Um, I'm not saying necessarily that they're the wrong tools, but basing um, judgments, high stakes judgments on very narrow tools in isolation can only lead to distorting factors and lead to um, very poor consequences, I'd suggest, for our children's prospects. Thanks. I'm looking to see if any other members wish to come in. I think, I think that concludes our um, session this morning. Can I thank you, um, Sue Palmer and Jackie Broke? both for coming and giving evidence and I'll suspend briefly to let you leave and we're going into private session. <laughs>